Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Artisan Lecture Series. I'm Victoria Dengel. I'm the executive director of the society. And I have to remark, I have never heard organ music in this space, so it's so exciting. Thank you, Sebastian, uh, for this. Um, for those of you not familiar with the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, we were founded in 1785 by uh, the skilled craftsmen of New York City. At that time, it was artisans who represented 22 different trades, including carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our 229-year-old year organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs, which include our Tuition-Free Mechanics Institute, which we've been operating for 158 years, the General Society Library, which was established in 1820, and this 176-year-old lecture series. Um, the General Society Library is the space you're in tonight. It's the second oldest library in New York City, and our, um, it's a membership circulating library. Our archives go back to 1785, um, so it's suited to both scholarly research as well as recreational reading. Tonight, we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. The Society is in its fourth season of featuring internationally known artisans who have come to the General Society to talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The Artisan Lecture Series promotes the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for generations to come. The series is curated by General Society member Camille Liard, and the General Society extends its sincere gratitude to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs the McQuestion Companies, Peter Panoya Architects, Ferguson and Shamamamian Architects, and John B. Murray Architects. And now Camille Weart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camille Weart, and I curate this artisan lecture series. It's my greatest uh, pleasure to welcome you tonight. We hold these lectures on a monthly basis featuring incredible artisans and unique talents. You will find on your seats and as well in the back a full list of sch schedule uh, with the upcoming dates and feel free to grab one on your way. Who is an artisan? An artisan is a person or company that makes high quality, distinctive product in small quantities, usually by hand and using traditional methods. An extraordinary well-known French writer from the Renaissance period, Michel de Montaigne, shared, I have seen during my time 100 artisans wiser and happier than directors of universities. So without further ado, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you, Sebastian Gluck. Sebastian, master organ builder, founded his company while in graduate school. He will discuss with you the history of organs, share with you examples of projects and techniques, and how he sees the evolution of his craft. Sebastian is the editor of the American Organ Building, a member of the International Society of Organ Builders, and the professional circle of New York Landmark Conservancy. We invite you to hold your questions Till the end, there will be time um, for Q&A and after the lecture and a reception to follow. Thank you and enjoy. Sebastian. Hi. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Is this too loud? Okay, uh, I'm often accused of mumbling at lectures, so uh, just hold up your hand if you can't hear anything. Um, First, I'd like to thank the society for this, this unexpected honor. I walked by this building and, and um, was sort of fascinated by you know, what goes on in there and what is it. And, um, it's a great space to uh, discuss my life's obsession um, because uh, our, our artisan colleagues in the motion picture arts and sciences love to film in this room because despite how uh, 
talented their set designers are. They could not think this up. And the reason they can't think this up is, like any venerable institution, it is an accumulation of, of the, the pursuit of knowledge and excellence, and that occurs over time with a variety of, of, of people and, and, and forces. And so whether it's the Museum of Locks or you want to come here and get a book on uh, book binding or metalworking or anything, or hear a lecture, it's, it's a great place. And uh, yes, it's true. Any time an organ builder enters a room, they size up the sound and they look around and they decide where the organ's gonna be and they design it in their head. So we have a few depth problems with that balcony, but the height is, oh, never mind. Um, so um, I would like to first let you know that, that any technology after the death of, of, of Edward VIII, I don't know about, so I'm, I'm gonna try to work this. Um, first of all, I start with this slide because it's absolutely magnificent, and it's, that's the organ in the town hall in Sydney, Australia. And uh, an international competition was held to, uh, to design this organ. Uh, and build it. It was uh, the the award went to a fellow named William Hill, an English builder who was really quite uh, quite fine and came up with the first real high pressure reeds in the world. But it is less inventive than the American entry, which was done by the first cousins of President Teddy Roosevelt, Frank and Hillborn Roosevelt, whose shop was on 18th Street here in New York City. Um, but the pipe organ is, 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 like other musical instruments, is a work of art used to convey other works of art. But it also involves the dimension of time. It isn't static. Um, it, it's not like uh, a painting in a museum that's hung on a wall and your interaction is visual and, and it's, it's uh, rather it, it um, an organ has much less meaning if it's not fulfilling its musical function. It's great metalworking, it's great carving, gilding, painting, exercises in sacred proportion. But if it doesn't have its musical voice, it, it, uh, it is not fulfilling itself as a true work of art. Um, I believe uh, this is ooh, success. Um, uh, because of their more common use in churches and synagogues, pipe organs are considered useful wares, and they therefore last for centuries, uh, such as this one in Sion in Switzerland. Uh, this is what we call a swallow's nest position. It just sort of hangs off the wall, um, and that's very well engineered. It's not just stuck up there with a wad of chewing gum. Um, you'll find there's one organ in Paris where uh, the organ is, uh, hangs off the wall on an exceptionally complex um, iron frame designed by a, uh, a young engineer named Gustav Eiffel. Uh, so you'll find that, that the allied arts and sciences all contribute to organ building. Um, but this organ dates from 1380. It's been in continuous use for 735 years. And what this really means is, is the organ is not old fashioned, but has been considered relevant and modern for centuries. It's always been modern. And, and in the same way that what we think of as old music now, classical music, was contemporary music, was new music when it was written. So there's, there's a, a, a consistent element of modernity here. Um, and, um, the organ shows up, uh, it, it sort of influences our lives, but we don't really pay attention to it. We don't see it. But um, if we look, whether it shows up in furniture, modern furniture, um, uh, interactive sculpture, um, public interactive sculpture, um, public monuments, this is the famous Sibelius monument. Um, postage stamp from the Republic of Togo, uh, or one of my favorites at the uh, Biennale in Venice, a cash machine. 
um, where artisans built this cash machine and uh, depending on how much you withdrew and what other transactions you were doing, it, it did its thing. And it's, it's actually beautifully made and shows, you know, the uh, polished um, uh, metal pipes in the front, the wooden, the wooden pipes, the lower pipes are, are actually composed the side of the case. It's based on um, the kind of narrow-waisted in-flight cases you would see in North German organs of, let's say, the 17th and 18th century. Um, so the, uh, I just think it shows up a lot in life and we don't even really think about it. Um, and I believe that if people knew more about the pipe organ, about that, the fact that not too long ago it had enjoyed an important and quite entertaining role in America's everyday life, everybody would love the pipe organ. And uh, this is actually not an, an, in America, this is the Royal Albert Hall. This was taken in 1931. And the most unusual uh, thing about this particular photograph is not that it's a young lady hugging a 32-foot open diapason, it's her shoes. Um, but uh, during the Roaring Twenties, uh, pipe organs were uh, not only standard equipment in, in movie theaters, but they were installed in cocktail lounges, hotel ballrooms, dance halls, concert halls, coffee houses, and high school auditoria. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but there were three dozen pipe organs designed and built for this city's high schools. And I'm not talking about denominational high schools, uh, which also had pipe organs, but secular public schools. There may be something to this in that music is the one stimulus that activates the entirety of the brain. So um, there was a time when you heard the organ at school assembly and you sang with it. Uh, in, in not in any way that, that was connected to, to religious uh, meanings. There were pipe organs built for the headquarters of an insurance company in Hartford and an automobile showroom in, Connecticut, in, in California. And they had paper rolls that played them automatically. Uh, those of you who know Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Larkin Company administration building in Buffalo, it had an absolutely mammoth pipe organ in the central court, and every employee was familiar with the daily sounds of this instrument. And it, it could go from this, this soothing whisper to a roar that actually shook the foundations of, of a right building, which is difficult to do because they were monumentally constructed. Um, and they really were the, 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 the grandest of, of entertainments. We didn't think of them um, as, you know, otherwise. So, I guess I begin our journey with this, this image of an organ built in the 1970s by Detlef Kloiker um, in L'Eglise de Notre Dame de Neige. Uh, and it's to dislodge your preconceptions about the stodgy, antiquated nature of the pipe organ. Um, most people don't even know that pipe organs are being built anymore, even though they see them, <laughs> uh, let alone in the form of the hand of God. Um, nonetheless, this still plays into the false idea that the pipe organ is limited to the Christian church and that, um, and that the pipe organ uh, began its evolution there. While the Byzantine court bestowed such an instrument upon Charlemagne's father in AD 757, the pipe organ did not become a predictable fixture in the church until the late 15th century and did not bear an established presence until at least a century after that. Um, the, organs are, the organ's origins actually date to the time of the death of Alexander the Great, when in about 322, 323 uh, BC, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, um, Ctesibios, who was a, a barber, inventor, physicist, um, invented what we now know as the, the early organs. They were rudimentary with only a few pipes, and they were driven by water pistons um, and they gained the name Hydraulis. Um, an or early organ is clearly depicted on a coin from the time of Nero. So uh, this would probably be, I guess, first century uh, AD. Um, 
shown again here in a line drawing for clarification. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of people have been curious about that, so here is actually a modern reconstruction of a hydraulis, and it is accompanied by uh, a pair of modern reconstructions of ancient Romans. Um, I can vouch for the, the authenticity of the hydraulis. Um, but uh, pipe organs, they show up in Roman mosaics, uh, including this one, which shows the organ and brass instruments. These were used out of doors at gladiatorial events. And um, let me see if I can do this. Here is the hydraulis, and it is uh, played by a, by, a, by a woman because that's the gentler art. And then you have this, which is called a tuba. Um, that's the, the Latin word for trumpet. And these are the, the magnificent helicons, which were the bass trumpets uh, often carried in, in battle. Um, this fellow here is uh, actually not a gladiator, but there were mock gladiators at the sides um, engaging in mock battles, but they were with the orchestra. And um, so you can imagine that this little thing used outdoors in a, in a stadium full of screaming people had it made a certain amount of, of noise. Um, here is yet another mosaic, and there you can more clearly see the he helicon. And uh, we really don't know the range of these instruments. Those pipes are not to scale. They're, they're sort of uh, artistic license there. Um, but they were common enough that they appear in, in, uh, in quantity during the Roman period. Um, the, uh, now, here's a modern helicon, <laughs> and uh, this, this is a photo from 1909. I just found it fascinating because this gentleman uh, lived in Canada. He was a photographer, uh, was interested in archaeology, farming, and stuff, and this the society here would be a perfect place for him. Um, but there he was, and he had himself photographed with his helicon, and I've named two organ stops helicon in my life, much to the consternation of my, my colleagues. Um, but uh, pipe organs, uh, archeological excavations in the Roman settlement of uh, Aquincum in Hungary have unearthed the physical remnants of this instrument. And here is a first century BC instrument in the archeological museum in Dion in Greece. Um, and uh, so we know they existed, and now we, we have not just illustrations, but physical remnants. Um, but how did we get from this? And you can see here, whoops. Sorry. Uh, it requires four people to pump and two to actually play. And uh, very early times, the keys were this big, and they had to hit them with their fists. Um, but how did we get from that to this? Uh, this, um, this was a, an enormous instrument built for public entertainment at the time of the stock market crash. Uh, this instrument was built for the Atlantic City Convention Hall with over 30,000 pipes, and some of them are nearly seven stories in height. Uh, the room is large enough to accommodate a helicopter in flight, and this is the only way they could fill the room with sound. Um, another interesting thing is it was the project of Senator Emerson Richards, who, uh, despite uh, the stock market crash and the depression, got the, uh, in, in typical New Jersey fashion, he had the high schools built with organs, uh, the highways built, and this massive conference hall with a convention hall with its, its instrument. And the console is large enough that it requires its own building within the building. It's this gorgeous kiosk and those, those uh, whoops, these, these are actually doors that roll shut. You'll also notice that it's, it's ergonomically designed so that every control, these thousands of controls can be reached uh, by by one person, and um, it's uh, NASA could learn something from that in terms of how things get reached. Um, but how we how we transmit the knowledge? Um, 
More books have been written about the organ than any other musical instrument in history, hundreds and hundreds of them in every conceivable language. And we now have cross-referenced um, uh, multilingual dictionaries of pipe organ building terms because they're so particular and peculiar. Um, and during the 1500s, treatises on organ building and playing, which go hand in hand, uh, began to emerge. And by the Enlightenment, vast encyclopedias included one or two volumes on, on the art of organ building. Uh, there was the opportunity to do these fantastic engravings. And um, this, is, uh, this is one from, from France. Uh, and uh, by the Industrial Revolution, we had um, precision engraving techniques. Mathematical tables were available for those who wanted to purchase them. And um, many of the concepts and materials uh, and processes have not changed in the 23 centuries during which we have been building pipe organs and they, um, organs remained the loudest controllable man-made devices until the development of modern artillery. And so they were not only great machines, great works of art, but they were fascinating and they were loud enough to be used as tower signals and, and other other such things. This is a fellow named George Ashdown Audsley uh, did a set of uh, books called The Art of Organ Building, published uh, here in the United States. Spectacular engravings. He was more interested in the decorative arts. He was a speculative organ builder, not an operative organ builder, but he did, he did build one organ for uh, the Maharaja of Mysore in India. Uh, but most of it was uh, theory. He wrote a lot of florid texts and did produce these beautiful engravings. Um, and uh, these are uh, of both mechanisms and pipe designs. Um, the, the piano and the organ are both keyboard instruments, but the piano is a percussion instrument and the organ is a wind instrument. What distinguishes the pipe organ from all other instruments is that any number of notes can be held indefinitely in theory, never wavering in pitch or tone, and never fading away. Raising the wind progressed from water pistons um, to bellows, um, and then pumped by hand or foot power. And um, here you see a series of three bellows and they each have a handle, and you actually push down on it. They're, they're quite easy. There's a system of well-calculated levers here, and it raises the bellow, and it drops under its own weight. You move to the next one and the next one. It's not all that strenuous. And I actually uh, went on a study trip to Spain, and I got to pump an organ, uh, 17th and 18th century organs, in this manner. They've reconstructed these bellow systems and they're absolutely fine. Now what's interesting here is you have the uh, happy but starved uh, peasant here and then the gentleman playing the instrument here. And so we have this, this cutaway here. You can see the action runs here, all the pipes above him, the pedal keyboard here, the action that runs under the pedal board to this section of the organ behind him, which is on the balcony rail. and. Um, uh, I don't know in the text, I think the four must refer to the wig, and uh, of course no well-dressed gentleman plays the organ without his sword. So uh, that is 18th century France for you. Um, but uh, so we had, um, we still build wedge bellows today. This is up in the, the Fisk shop in Gloucester where they're building a wedge bellows. Um, but. Um, by the Industrial Revolution, we had gas-fired engines and water engines were used to turn cranks that moved the feeder bellows to fill the reservoirs. Um, water was pumped to the top of the church tower and gravity fed to the pumping mechanism. Um, you know, there was a time in this city where you dreaded not having, you really dreaded having a fire on a Sunday because so many organs had water engines that the pressure drop meant you couldn't fight a fire. So that was, that was a very interesting aspect of, of how, uh, you know, organ technology had a, 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 an influence on, on, on daily life. Um, 
In modern times, we use rotary fans, uh, turbines, to raise the wind. And here, this is the blower in the Atlanta Fox Theater. You can see the scale of these turbines, and um, I don't know why he's so happy, but... Um, from the generation point of the wind, whether it's uh, by uh, foot power, uh, hand power, or turbines. Um, oh, here's another turbine that's uh, whoops, feeding a, a pneumatic relay here. Um, and this is just a switching system inside the organ, but it's all done with uh, leather membranes and, and uh, uh, electromagnets and things like that. Uh, this is from the 1920s. Um, it goes to a, a, uh, a reservoir, and the reservoir holds the, the wind and, uh, until it's demanded by the pipes. This is uh, an organ in the choir division in the North Triforium of Temple Emanuel, uh, an organ I built 12 years ago, and it has an interesting... I devised this system so that these reservoir heads uh, you can see the gussets there. They will eventually wear out from the high pressure wind and just from flexing all the time as demands are made on the wind. These compression spring screws, there's no glue here. This is a horsehide gasket under there. Those lift off and that can be taken to the shop and done as bench work. Um, I devise a system of barbell plates to weight these to, to get really good winding on an organ you need. Uh, linear motion from these leaf springs um, and to keep lin constant linear motion on the top of the, of the reservoir and then you need uh, um, the inertial mass of weights. If you go into 19th and 18th century organs you see tombstones, rocks, radiators, all kinds of things put on there. Um, and uh, this is a much cleaner system and as that moves up and down you'll see there's an accordion here made of horse hide um, and that feeds compressed air from here up into the wind trunks into the organ. And the only way we could do that is to have this, this basically uh, sealed accordion system that's, that's there. Um, the, uh, the mechanisms for controlling the instrument developed for centuries as a system of cams and levers made of wood, sometimes metal, and mechanical action organs are still being built today. So uh, this is a modern mechanical action from the rear. And you can see we have, um, let me see. Uh, these are now aluminum tubes instead of wood, which means they don't, they don't warp and twist and get out of alignment. Um, and uh, so this is, this is from underneath. The pedal board is here. The keyboards are up there. But this is where the knee panel would go. And you see this is just uh, simply a matter of transmission. The problem with it, complex mechanical actions is as these felt discs and leather buttons here compress and they're, they're there to keep the action quiet so it doesn't, don't get a lot of rattling. As they compress over time, you get lost motion in the action and the action becomes spongy and you have to either replace these or tighten up the action. Uh, here's one viewed from the front, and uh, there would normally be a, a music rack here, um, and these are the knobs that control the stops of the various divisions. And here's some poor soul uh, hooking up pedal couplers. Now, um, as organs grew larger, the, the inertial mass member-to-member -member friction and lost motion of the many connection points cause the actions to become heavy and st so heavy and stiff as to distract the musician from the art of music making. So um, tubular pneumatic actions uh, liberated the organist from the, the, this, this brute athleticism uh, that was required to play the organ and the organ console or key desk could be placed at some distance from the main body of the organ. And that made conducting um, and hearing balances better, despite the personal uh, and direct connection to the instrument. Uh, and that's been an ongoing battle, uh, theoretically, amongst organ builders. Do we maintain mechanical action where you can feel the parts of the organ moving through your hand, 
or do we go to pneumatic or electric actions, which are essentially telegraphy? And it's inconceivable to us that I would say, your violin is up in that balcony and you just push these buttons to play it. Because you have to, you hug your cello, you hold your violin, you are part of your flute or your oboe, it is your breath of life. And the organ, because it's so, it's, it's so massive and such an amazing piece of machinery, there is some detachment even in mechanical action organs because um, you don't hear things in balance. And that's one of the things we haven't solved in many centuries. Um, the uh, tubular pneumatic action, uh, here we have uh, the backside of a console. So here you would see the knobs at the sides and the keyboards, pedal boards down here. And these are just hundreds of miles of, of uh, lead tubing, and if they're really sealed, it's a very responsive action. Quite ingenious. Um, and you see some of these uh, today being, you know, they're still in place and there are ways of restoring them. Um, and this is the installation of the pneumatic tubes in the great uh, organ in the, uh, the, the Dome in Berlin, uh, built by the Zauer firm, and it has just been restored. It's been restored with its, its tubular pneumatic actions. And I have to say, it is one of the grandest instruments around. It makes a, a, a just a terrific sound. And there was, a, there was a time when it would have been considered stylistically uh, out of fashion. Organs get thrown out all the time, which is unfortunate. Um, in, in museums, if paintings go out of style, sculptures go out of style, they go into storage. And then they're, they're um, they're, when they, the painter comes back into fashion again, they're put back on ex exhi exhibition. But it, organs are used every day and they're subject to the tastes and whims of, of um, people who don't necessarily have taste but still have whims. Um, but this is, this is uh, quite a spectacular organ. Um, and then by, by the 1920s and 30s, we have relay rooms such as this. This is in the Atlantic City Convention Hall. And if you look at these, these are all individual wires and they're bundled like that. Thousands of miles of wiring here. Um, and this is the central nervous system of the organ. But more importantly, it's a binary computer. The way the electro-pneumatic organ works and the, and the pneumatic organ works is that it's just thousands and thousands of these little leather membranes, and they're either on or off. They're either inflated or deflated, and they control these vast instruments to the point where you could memorize combinations of stops and play organs through this system. So before we had computers, we were having binary computers built by organ builders um, in, this, uh, in this way. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, um, as early as 1759, um, Jesuit priest Jean-Baptiste de Laborde actually used electricity to operate little bells from a harpsichord keyboard. This is the middle of the 18th century. And patents for the use of electricity in organ building were eventually granted to a Scottish clockmaker uh, named Alexander Bain in 1847 and a, a Parisian named Pierre-Emile Stein in 1854. So we have, um, the, the French were just amazing. I mean, they, they came up with telegraphy and fluorescent lighting in the 19th century. You know, we're just amazing things here. But um, I had mentioned uh, uh, Hilborn Roosevelt earlier, the cousin of, first cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. And he actually, claimed this invention from the, from the, the 1740s and 50s um, as his own. Uh, he had gone to Europe in 1872 with family money and taken notes in all the great uh, organ shops, came back here, opened a shop, and when he returned from Europe, he, he had displayed very grandly at the, at the Philadelphia uh, Centennial Exposition an organ with two stops on electric action. And he became known for generations as the man who brought electricity to organ building. Uh, he just brought it here from France. Um, 
But what happened was that sections of the organ could be flung to the various corners of the auditorium, and pipes could be tucked in towers of churches and called the echo division or the antiphonal division, and, and um, you know, uh, ethereal divisions in the domes of synagogues and, and uh, tucked into the proscenia of theaters. Um, and it was all made possible by, by these things. And nowadays we have, this is a solid state logic relay and a lot of people use uh, these computer systems. Um, and um, my firm uh, builds almost exclusively with modern electro-pneumatic action, which developed during the first quarter of the last century. And since that, the period between the wars, it has become the most popular type of mechanism in this nation. Um, this is what the interior of, a, uh, of an electron, uh, pneumatic wind chest looks like from below. And um, you're lying on your back. These are pipes sticking up in the air. This is called the primary action. You see all those little glove leather pouches. And under here, there are similar discs of leather throughout the organ and more pneumatic tubing inside. Um, and we use a lot of animal hide, uh, mostly um, horse hide for bellows, although there are reservoirs and bellows in Australia now uh, with 150-year-old kangaroo leather. It's amazingly tough stuff. Uh, and it's now being sold again because it solves the overpopulation problem with the government and it solves the organ builder's problem of perishable materials. Leather is now increasingly uh, subjected to problems with atmospheric pollutions, which degrades the leather. We can no longer use mercury-cured leather, but it lasts for hundreds of years, not hundreds of years, but about 100 years if in the right way. Um, we use the, uh, the hide of the hair sheep, which is used for the most expensive gloves. There's a, uh, a glove artisan on this, this lecture series, too. Um, but you don't just use the hide. You have to, after it goes through the tanning and curing process, you have to put it on a light table because uh, leather has pores. Where if you have hair sheep, it has hair. You have to make sure there are no holes in it. You have to make sure that there are no stressed parts that came from where the hide hung on the, the spine of the animal or was folded in the armpit of the animal. So even leather selection is one of the the, 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 the aspects of, of organ building that's, that's, that's so interesting. Um, now, the, uh, the organ has the greatest range of any instrument, 11 octaves. Um, so the pipes range uh, from seven stories uh, tall to about a quarter of an inch in speaking length. It also has the greatest number of tonal colors. Most instruments can play only one note at a time. And for a finite length of time, and even stringed instruments in the piano, which can play multiple notes simultaneously, have essentially one stop. So what we call a stop is a set of pipes that produces a particular tonal quality. Uh, so organ pipes are made in match sets called ranks. And um, ranks of pipes consist of one pipe for each pitch or key on the keyboard, and they are matched in construction and graduated in size. So each different pipe form creates a different tonal color, such as a flute, bassoon, clarinet, or oboe, and entire sets must be made for each particular form of voice. Um, and the way that would work is if I wanted a, uh, the best analogy is if we wanted a clarinet, I'd have to give each one of you a clarinet. And each of you could only play one note. So to play a piece of music, I'd have to point to each one of you. Well, here you are. Um, and um, here you see inside of an organ, this is an English horn. That's the form the English horn takes. You'll notice there's one for each uh, note on the keyboard. Obviously a brass trumpet there. Um, there's a flute made of wood. These are orchestral strings there. Uh, back here is an oboe. Um, so each, each form uh, produces a different uh, sound. Now, one of the interesting things about 
metal organ pipes is that they are fastened together with the same material from which they are made. Now that sounds strange, but the alloys of tin and lead in various proportions are cast into sheets, cut into components that are shaped and assembled with solder, which is also an alloy of tin and lead. Um, there's, it's the differential in the composition and the melting point that makes one, one adhere the other and, and not melt it. So the addition of, in addition to these pewter alloys, pipes can be made of copper, brass, zinc, and very spe various species of uh, timber. So here we have uh, ingots or pigs of metal. Pipe metal is cast into sheets in the same manner it has been for centuries. Um, it probably descends from the medieval cathedral builders casting sheets of lead for the cathedral roofs where a compacted bed of sand was used and the metal was poured out on it um, and allowed to cool. Um, and uh, so the, the, these metals are melted together in a crucible and they're poured into this trough and that trough is dragged along uh, a slab of stone and this slab of stone is covered with either canvas or now we can sometimes use fireproof uh, fabric um, and it pours out the sheet of liquid metal. Uh, there's another case of him dragging the, the trough down and you see the scrap goes here and that can be melted down again and skimmed for dross and used again. Um, that's it prior to cooling. And actually what's interesting is when, sometimes when you pour hot uh, molten metal onto the stone and the cast, what we call the casting table, it actually sings. It has this, the, it sort of moans and woos and everything because that's, that's, that the physicist will tell you why it, it does that. But that way you know you've had a good pour. Um, and then it's, as it cools, it changes color and composition. It's cut from the table and it has these spots in it. And at least spots, watching these spots form is pretty interesting because um, the, uh, there's a lattice of, of one of the metals and then the, uh, the tin holding it together in this little knitted matrix and then the, the higher density of the, of, the, uh, of the lead in the inside the spots. And you can tell or with experience the composition of metal, I can look at something and say, well, that's 55% that's tin or that's 50% tin by the size of the spots. Um, and then the sheets are rolled up and they're stored for six months to a year so that they can age. Uh, pipe metal has memory, so uh, you have to be careful of it. With it. Sometimes people uh, hammer it to increase the density. Um, and uh, it used to be scraped either by a, with a hand plane or with uh, a sheet of broken glass that had a very sharp straight edge and you could draw just as you would with a cabinet scraper on wood. You could, you could do that for that. Here is a, a rotary plane and the sheet of metal that's been cast gets clamped onto there and it rotates at a speed where you can take the chisel uh, as if you were turning wood and just very, very carefully uh, even the thickness. Some builders taper their metal so that it's actually thinner at the top of the pipe and thicker at, toward the mouth so that you don't get uh, collapsing and settling of the mouth and, and it, it gives a particular ring to the tone. Then the, the pipes are um, cut into what we call flats and so you, you, you have these rectangular pieces become the cylinders and then the wedge-shaped pieces become the the, the foot of the pipe. Um, and here you can see him forming the mouth. And, uh, and these are the, the feet of the pipes and that's, that's the tapered mandrel. And they come in graduated sizes as well and various degrees of taper. Uh, then they're tack soldered. The, uh, the, the sizing you see on the pipe actually protects it from the heat of the iron so that the metal itself doesn't doesn't melt. Um, and then they are cleaned and they're, they're ready for voicing uh, and they're stored in their racks, in their ranks there. Um, often you will see um, 
the uh, markings on pipes. Uh, this is a 19th century pipe, uh, Nicolas Chatelain, who uh, worked for Roosevelt, and you see the note of the pipe, the name of the stop, and the scale number, scale 58, uh, which is the pro di diametric progression for that particular stop. And scaling refers to, on a very basic level, the relationship between the diameter and the, of the pipe and the pitch produced. And this is a very extreme uh, set of scales here because uh, it's in a, a cinema organ. And you'll see here, um, this sounds like a foghorn. These are meant to sound like orchestral violins. So for the same note, you can have uh, a very tubby pipe with the, the mouth cut up almost square and then actually leathered to decrease the harmonics. So this is a big, big hooty kind of foghorn sound which would be used in a theater organ installation. And then um, here you have these very narrow scaled violins. This is almost pure lead. That's a zinc foot and a common metal body. And then here you see uh, the spotted metal. And to my eye, this looks like about 50% tin. Um, there. And um, wooden pipes. Um, wooden pipes actually post-date post uh, metal pipes. Um, they came to the organ later probably because drying techniques, precision cutting, and, and proper glues required to make them airtight were not fully developed before the techniques of metal working. Um, but they are less susceptible to damage than their metal cousins and can be made in small batches uh, called cuttings. Um, and uh, they can be stored for future use. Um, this is an interesting photograph of uh, Royal College of Music in London, uh, the new organ being installed um, late last year. Uh, it was given by, of all people, Sir Elton John who was, uh, who is an organist, um, and he studied at uh, the Royal College, and he didn't like the organ they had, so he commissioned a new one. And here are some of the, uh, the wooden pipes waiting to be installed. There's the main case up there, the framework being put up. Um, and these, these are uh, coming in. Here's an interesting array of experimental wooden pipes, and it's the kind of thing that should probably be on one of the balconies here. Um, we're always experimenting with uh, pipe forms. You'll notice at the display window um, two of several experimental pipes that I, reed pipes I designed are, are in there. But uh, let me see. If you look at this, this may be the same pitch as this. It's the size of it's the volume of the air column that makes a different differences in mouth structure. Um, and uh, this one's very interesting. This is a, uh, a flared open wooden pipe. Um, and maybe I'll make one of those for fun. And uh, here is a set of wooden pipes that are triangular. Uh, the triangular wooden pipes take a lot of uh, meticulous joinery. They're very difficult to build. And um, the remarkable thing is there's absolutely no difference in the sound. Uh, <laughs> they were a great fad in the 1920s, and some people persisted up until the, the 1950s. But uh, the only bare advantage to, to, to my mind is that because they're triangular, they, they stack, they, they, they're more snug on the wind chest. But, it's the equivalent of building a quadrangular pipe with a slightly wider mouth. Um, and um, here is uh, a box organ. Sometimes you go to a concert of Baroque music and you see a little organ on stage, but you've never, got, you've never seen inside it. Well, this is made entirely of wood and it's uh, called a continuo organ. And um, you can see various forms of pipes here, wooden pipes with stoppers, wooden ones with drilled stoppers, which change the sound. These with a 45 degree angle cut on them and the little metal rolls to tune them. Um, and these little things here, the keyboard goes here and it pushes down these and there's a simple valve at the bottom. It's a very, very direct, simple action. So when you see one of these on stage, 
at, at, uh, at Lincoln Center or at Carnegie Hall. Now you know what's on the inside. Um, wood pipes can get large. Uh, this is the 32-foot double open diapason, and it was built for somebody's house. Uh, if those of you who have been to Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, uh, this was the Pierre S. DuPont mansion. Um, and uh, every great robber baron had an organ built by this company, Aeolian. This was their, there you notice the four-story erecting room in uh, Garwood, New Jersey. Um, their instrument is still exists in the Frick collection. Um, but there were hundreds of these built all over the world in, in very wealthy people's mansions, and they had these role players. Um, if you go to the Jewish Museum now, that's the old Warburg mansion, the organ in the ballroom is actually walled in, it's, it's walled up there. But there's a Gothic organ case and it, you know, they're, they're all over the place. But this is, this is magnificent and um, you'll see here, the trees weren't large enough so, or they couldn't angle them into the house so these were built in sections that are bolted together. Um, my instrument at uh, Temple Emanuel, re we retained the 1929 uh, double diapason of this size. And um, there's a gentleman in the room here for whom I'm building a, a, a double organ uh, this year. And we're building our first metal 32 foot stop. So that should, it's designed to imitate orchestral uh, contrabasses. Um, so the process of, of voicing pipes um, is, uh, is a little bit like orthodonture. And there he's opening up the flue of the pipe. There he's measuring it for proportion. Everything is in a mathematical proportion. Here he's cutting the pipe mouth higher. And then they're put on these small uh, wind chests in small rooms called voicing machines, but there are voicing jacks. And a lot of the speech correction is done before the, the uh, organ gets to the church and gets reassembled. And, um, you do all kinds of adjustments, and there's a keyboard attached, and then a separate tuning stop. So you always have a tuning reference, uh, and that's always on a separate wind supply because the organ pipes you're making now may be designed for a different pressure than your, your, your principal tuning rank. And once you get the organ built and inside, uh, and everything is nice and clean and wonderful, um, you start doing the tonal finishing, which is the note-to-note -note quality of, of, each, uh, of each pipe so that the progression from note to note is very smooth. You may have one that you want treble ascendancy to get much broader and more thrilling in the treble like an orchestral flute uh, or you want something to trail off in the top like an English horn or get uh, plumper in the bass like a bassoon. And there's, it's, it's an interesting thing because I'm up in the pipes fidgeting with them and the manager of the firm is at the console and uh, he says, well, that pipe si sounds anxious, that pipe sounds angry, uh, that pipe's too shy, um, that pipe sounds constipated. You know? And I, if we give these human attributes to it, it's not just louder, softer, brighter, duller, that, uh, because this is a living, breathing instrument. Um, that's how it's done. And um, so the, these are the various, uh, various tools that are used in, in different ways. This is, um, this is not one of my instruments, this is a, a colleague, and, and, uh, but it gives a good, a good idea of how little space you have in there. Um, and then uh, that, that passage board may be less than a foot, a foot, you know, 12 to 14 inches, and that's, that's your working space. And you have to keep your hands very, very clean because finger oil uh, is not good for the pipes. Um, now, reed pipes are a, a coupled resonance system. Um, what uh, happens is everything that's generated down in here, a little tongue of brass, um, and, and the pressure comes in here, that's set in vibration, and then the resonator on top qualifies the sound. So what we call uh, the motor or the bottom assembly, this generates a whole bunch of harmonics, and then the resonator form sort of selectively emphasizes what's, what's gonna happen. So this is one of them taken apart. 
There's a wooden wedge here, though we're now using brass wedges because these tend to dry out over time and fall out. And they're, they're what clamps the tongue into this thing here. And the shape of this, what we call the shallot, and I don't know what it has to do with little onions, but that term has been with us for hundreds of years. Um, and the opening in it, that, that determines also the harmonic content. Uh, there's one assembled, much lower in pitch. Sometimes to slow the weight, the, the reed down, we add inertial mass of a, of a, of a brass weight on there. Uh, and that for the, for the lower pipes. Uh, on the notice we're, um, that was sent out to you, I'm, I'm holding a reed from a, 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 a 32 foot pipe and you can see uh, this huge weight that's been soldered onto it. Um, now these are very various resonator forms. This is uh, what we'd have for a tuba. This is a trumpet. You'll notice the stem is zinc and the bell is spotted metal. This is called a Rorschalmai, and this tube is brass. This cylinder is spotted metal, and this tuning slide is coke tin. And then this is a uh, crim horn and it's made of copper. You'll notice here, this is a, a flat bottom wide shallot, and then here, these are the domed parallel walled ones, and those are uh, more characteristic of French organ building. Um, and this is a clarinet stop. Um, my firm happens to be very proud of their clarinets. They're kind of big and woody, and, and if I can manage to get the video to work, you will hear one of them in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, and of course, this is the Wurlitzer uh, style of brass trumpet. And you'll see this is the bottom assembly here, stabilizing collar for the tuning wire. This is what goes up and down to change the length of the reed. And then a brass telescopic sleeve uh, to adjust the final length of that there. Um, curving the reeds is done on either a wooden block or a steel block, and that's a, a special sets of curves are used. You swipe this um, knife across it, and that changes the tension of the metal and, and curves it into a precise curve, and you can change that to change the tonal quality. I use sometimes a wooden block, sometimes I use a metal block, depending on the pressure and the thickness of the metal. Um, and reeds can also be made of wood. Now the most dramatic reeds, of course, are the horizontal reeds. Sometime uh, the, the, the earlier, uh, the Spanish organs, they started building these uh, horizontal reeds and, and they, they fire front and back uh, in, the, in the organs, sometimes in the aisle, sometimes across the aisle to each other. There we go. And they, they've recurred in modern times. People have revived this style of this is the famous emperor's organ in Toledo in Spain um, with its stone casework and hundreds of trumpets. And here's another one. Um, now, in, the, um, in academic settings, uh, sometimes an organ will be stripped down to, you can just see the mechanisms here. Um, and uh, this is, this is a, stu a teaching studio organ and you can see the mechanical action runs and these louvers that control the volume of sound are changed by a pivoting pedal there. And um, organs are massive structures and there are s sometimes several divisions behind shutters, moving shutters to control uh, the amplitude of the organ. And then sometimes they have no casework at all. Uh, and there uh, was a fellow named Walter Holtkamp who, uh, whose instruments are, in my opinion, uh, just beautiful works of sculpture. Uh, interestingly, I don't like the, the chromatic arrangement of pipes here uh, because of the way that the wind balances and the tuning goes, but just visually, uh, his work was, was extraordinary. And as a sculptor, I think this is just one of his, his finest efforts. Um, he was a visual artist and a visionary um, and one was the, one of the few people who went back to uh, look at the Baroque organ seriously and try to adapt it to modern times. Um, and here's another one of his in uh, Cleveland Museum of Art. So, 
Um, so organs, uh, the ranks are assembled in divisions, and these divisions are uh, pretty much, uh, it's, it's how we, um, the, the, uh, each division has its own character. It's like its own county. Um, and uh, the, the pipes are related to each other in, in how they produce music and produce, uh, and how it relates to the literature being played. Um, organ control systems, um, you know, where do you play the organ from? Well, you play it from the console. Uh, this was the organ in the Rainbow Room uh, at uh, Rockefeller Center. And uh, I mean, to me, it's kind of ugly, but it's, it's goofy, and at the time, they, they, they liked this. This is in the Wanamaker Grand Court in Philadelphia. Those of you who've shot there know that this organ is played three times a day at the store, at the store opening and the store closing, and at noon there's a recital. So you hear organ music while you're shopping, but you don't think about it. And it's, this is many, many thousands of pipes. It's a very large organ. It began its life as the exposition organ at the Louisiana Purchase Centennial Exposition. And uh, two things you had there was the largest number of organ recitals, greatest number of organ recitals ever given uh, to, up until that time, and the invention of the ice cream cone. So that's, but it, it was then transported here and gradually enlarged by uh, Rodman Wanamaker. Um, whenever you went to the theater, there was the organ, and uh, Compton and other English builders uh, used to do these wonderful glass uh, housing for, the, the console is actually only here. This is all uh, construct, including the bench, you know, that's, um, and they changed color. They, you could have a little light show, but they were, uh, but it, you know, buried in here is a standard horseshoe theater console there. Um, and uh, in, in some traditions, like in the Baltic area in the, in the 18th century, um, this dates from about the time of American independence. This is actually a copy of it. Um, these uh, wonderful large iron keys were used instead of, uh, so they look like giant you know, keys to the castle gates. Um, and uh, this organ, you know, it's the same thing, but in Art Deco and in this striped ebony. Um, and then these er ergonomically considered organs where they were so large, this is the, the uh, largest playing church organ in the world, I believe, at the, uh, the Cadet Chapel uh, at uh, West Point. Um, and so you had to figure out how do you reach everything? Um, and it's, it becomes like the, the cockpit of a spacecraft. And one wonders at what point there's so much going on in an organ, so many pipes, so many sounds, that it loses its individual character. Uh, there are a lot of organs that, you know, you can hear a recording and say, I know that instrument, I know that builder. But when you get to a certain size, I wonder really whether, whether it loses its personality. Um, and this is a typical theater organ console. Um, but it's important to know that the what killed the organ as a secular instrument was the fact that in 1926, motion pictures began to speak for themselves. We no longer had use for this, which was called the unit orchestra. Once people had dialogue instead of dialogue cards, um, uh, you didn't have to have a damsel in distress doing this and a card that said, woe is me, you could just have it happen. And you didn't have the, 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 the one-man orchestra there to engender that emotion it, it was part of the soundtrack. So suddenly, what you looked forward to at the movies, which was organ playing when you came in, popular tunes, then sing along with a bouncing ball at intermission, and then they'd call your ticket number and if, if it matched, you'd win either a bicycle or a, a set of dishes, and you'd go up and they'd play the music on the organ while you were receiving your prize. And when you left, you heard organ music. That ended with the talkies. So we were left with a church. Now, 
the other thing that was a real hit to the organ was in the 19th century when we had uh, waves of immigrants because it used to be that we had like you know every town hall city hall municipal auditorium had these giant organs and you'd see these programs where uh, it would say um, uh, overture to Leonore by Mr. L. Beethoven uh, overture to the magic flute by Mr. W. Mozart and then Stars and Stripes Forever by Mr. You know, J.P. Souza and it would be this combination of both popular and classical music. But when immigrants came over, in addition to coming with you know, the coat on their back, they had tucked under their arm their flute, their violin, their clarinet. Suddenly, every city had an orchestra, and a municipal organist wasn't necessary. So there are very few church organs left there, uh, theater organs left, a lot of them were thrown out, some were repossessed by companies, stripped of their automatic percussions and sound effects that we call the toy counters, and sold to churches. Um, so, um, but that's a pretty snazzy theater organ console. And um, people are now build, still building in, in traditional styles, in Baroque styles. Uh, you may have noticed these keys are black uh, and white. This is the way keyboards are actually made. This is the traditional keyboard. The white and black keyboard that we see now is a modern construct. Um, and just the ivory plating on the keys is one thing. These are, um, uh, these look like rosewood to, to me. And then these beautifully arcaded key fronts and then the uh, lathe turned draw knobs. And these may be ivory or bone or some kind of uh, hard nut is turned on a lathe to do those little details there. Um, and of course, this, uh, this is the organ in the concert hall in, 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 uh, in Budapest. And that's a, a very modern design there. Uh, I should also say that when organs arrive at the church, they take up a lot more room disassembled than they do when they're assembled. Uh, this is sort of counterintuitive, but um, so that will take up much less space once it's assembled. Um, so where were organs? Well, here's the Hotel Astor Ballroom. And there's the Waldorf Astoria. And its console, that organ has been torn out. It wasn't the only organ in the hotel. Uh, this organ you can still hear. This is the organ in Balboa Park. And you can sit under the stars. It was built for the, uh, the I believe, the Panama Pacific Exposition. Um, and of course, back then, it was a much quieter world. You didn't have the airport nearby, but you can still hear this organ. Um, this is once again the Grand Chord organ in Philadelphia. This is an organ that was in an artist's studio in, the, in New York. He was uh, eccentric, but had fine taste, and uh, there's his easel and his dead bear on the floor, and he had an organ in the house. Um, here's uh, Mr. Searle's estate. And so many houses had wonderful organs in them. And then, of course, there were the great dance hall organs where uh, they were run on um, punched uh, cardboard folding things like as if they were uh, hard versions of perforated role players. And uh, the, uh, this is a, a Mortier from France, but there was Gavioli in Italy and and uh, Verbeek in Belgium, and uh, these are very, very loud instruments. There were also fairground organs that could be heard for miles, and they were automatic playing organs. Um, this is one of three organs that was at Rockefeller Center. You've probably heard the organ at Radio City. There was another theater in there that had this, and of course, the broadcasting studio had one. Um, this is Carl Schertz High School in uh, in Chicago, and uh, it's quite a, an organ built by the Moeller Company. It's at the back of the stage, and it has to be very, very powerful to get past all the curtains, uh, and it's, it's going to be restored. Uh, and as I said, there are, um, there were originally three dozen organs built for high schools here.
here in New York. A lot of them in the Bronx for some reason. I don't know why. Um, here's one of my favorite organs. Uh, some of you may recognize it as the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery um, in, uh, in Glasgow. And uh, it just, you know, you can be out anywhere in the museum and this thing just fills it. It's, uh, and here it is from the front. So um, I'm going to, I've talked briefly about some of the things that go into the organs. And um, in the, in the mid-1980s, a student at Columbia was asked to build an organ for somebody's home. So I did. <laughs> this is Opus One, and um, even then I kind of was influenced by the past. The, uh, the arrangement of the, the knobs was based on a 19th century New York builder named John Gale Marklove, and I, I was just absolutely fascinated with that and was determined to build a console along those lines. And I, my first attempt at inlaying a music rack, this is the only photo of it I have. Um, and as you can see, it wasn't really finished, but I was determined to photograph it, and I'm glad I did. Um, this is another small organ that I, I built here in the city, and um, you'll notice it's, it's a, a, a sort of an exercise in proportions that if you draw an X here, you know, this is at the center. This is the progression of the pipes. The tuning collars are enameled in various colors to match the windows. Um, and uh, this actually comes off for the crucifer. They can carry this around. Um, and this, this organ actually was doomed to development. Uh, the church was, was raised. And uh, we took the organ out in time. It went into storage. And these 12 uh, highly polished pipes at the sides will show up in a later organ of mine because you don't, you know, for what it costs to make pipes, you conserve it. And that's another thing. You can see organs now uh, in cathedrals that uh, were last rebuilt in the 1940s, and they contain pipes from the 16th century or the, fifth, uh, the, the 17th century. We, sit, we, we respect the historic fabric of, of instruments. If our predecessors built something of value, we, we keep it. Um, this is uh, an organ I built in Cold Spring. Um, and a lot of people really like this organ. It's a lot of fun. It's very, very small. It's 11 sets of pipes. And um, I had come back from a, uh, a trip to uh, South Central and Eastern Germany to, to play all of the organs that, that Bach and Handel had played. And I saw a Gothic case in various shades of, of green. And I thought, well, that's nice. And the, and the, the pipes had this uh, swag line on the mouths. So I built this little instrument, and here's the key desk, um, and these little divisional plates, those are beveled uh, tiger maple. It's hard to see in the photograph. Um, and this is the little angel. You know, a lot of people put a triumphant angel, like in Kelvin Grove. He had four up there with their trumpets. And I just sort of thought, well, what if a, an angel just landed casually on the organ case uh, playing his violin? So. We call him Angelo, and there he is. Um, I won't tell you where the screw goes <laughs> that holds him in, but <laughs> um, I'm not much of a modernist, but um, I had a client. This is the Mormon Center across from uh, Lincoln Center, and um, you know, there, it's so hard to get in there. In fact, when the committee came from Salt Lake City, they had trouble getting in. <laughs> but uh, this is the, uh, the, the Stake Center Chapel. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very modern building, very spare. And uh, they wanted specific types of wood. And uh, I, I helped design the room acoustically, which is, which is important too. And this is a dramatic shot in the, uh, taken in the workshop aerially uh, of the organ set up. And it gives a better idea of the spatial massing of this organ. And it's, it's only for, for uh, choral accompaniment. I mean, for choral music is very important in the Mormon tradition. But they don't play concert literature on this organ. Um, 
the organ you heard when you were coming in was the organ at Faith Lutheran Church uh, in New Providence, uh, New Jersey. And uh, it was an A-frame church from the 1960s. They had an organ that was pretty dismal and um, decided to uh, have us uh, replace it, although I did convince them to keep some of the older pipes. So an organ starts with uh, a concept drawing. I had several, one was an odd composition of triangles and um, it, it, it didn't work out and I'd had several sketches, but this is kind of the direction in which we went and then sort of decided on, on fleshing it out here. Um, it's based on uh, the general massing of a North German 18th century organ, but instead of the, uh, and, and of course there's, there's this bits of numerology here you know, the, the, the 12 apostles, the, the Holy Trinity in the middle, but instead of having that as an encased section, it breaks through the cornice and, and flows upward. Um, and uh, the, uh, as you'll see when it's finally built, um, how the various, these are, poly, these are the 12 pipes that were in that other organ and then a different type of polishing is used on the central flats. These are spotted metal here. Um, and uh, one thing we did add is when, when the organ was finished, I noticed that it, it, it had some hard corners to it. So we put these little ears here, which are carvings of uh, maple, and that's a, a, a close up there of that. Um, this is inside that organ. And here's the rank of oboes. Here's the trump, harmonic trumpet. These are the viola da gamba in the back. And here, these pipes look very deep because they have two mouths, one on either side of the pipe. And it's a 19th century German standard, but it, it predates it. So these are older pipes. These are um, from the turn of the last century. But we incorporated them into this organ. Here's another section of the organ. These are open harmonic pipes, double length overblowing pipes, also with two mouths. And you can see how the progressions of, of size for the different harmonics are. And that's me in a well-posed photograph of doing the tonal finishing inside the organ. Um, uh, that was an interesting console to design because uh, I wanted to do tablets at the side rather than knobs. and uh, sort of based this on the residence organs of the 19 teens and 20s. And uh, I had a shot of it as built, but I guess that's not here. So we're gonna hear a bit on that organ in the form of a, uh, a video, and I will try to turn it on without You can also see this online if you'd like.
So I, I, uh, that's, that's the sound of one of the instruments. I realize I've gone over their time. I just wanted to show you a couple more projects. This is, uh, we had been asked to build an organ for Mayflower uh, Congregational Church in Oklahoma City. Um, all organs are usually commissioned by competition, uh, though sometimes I just get somebody who comes to me and says, you know, I want you to build the organ and that's it. But this was by competition. Um, this is one of me by one of the cases in the workshop. I look so happy. Um, <clears throat> this is the oboe d'amore rank, and it's uh, in the voicing room here. And this is its extension down into the bassoon range there. Um, this is the inside of the organ, the swell division. Uh, this is a full panorama of that division. You can see uh, the angled roofs to project the sound into the, into the church. Um, for some reason, I started painting pipes this Wedgwood Portland blue, and several builders have started copying me. But anyway, I was the first to do it. Uh, and that's in the choir division. And then uh, in front of that is this set of uh, ma mahogany pipes. And then this is the, the view down that soundboard. Stopped wooden pipes. Um, here's a, a big, uh, just a big open diapason there. Harmonic concert flute. Here's the clarinet and then a pair of strings there. And you can see the pivoting shutters here, which you saw in the video of the other organ. These are the keyboards being made for that organ. You'll notice that instead of ebony, I use uh, either walnut or rosewood for the sharps on, on my organs. Um, this is that console, uh, which turned out very nicely. Um, and this is the way the church started out. It was, uh, it was uh, very awkward. Uh, liturgically, nobody could move around. There was a tiny organ in here, seven sets of pipes, nothing in here. That was just an empty space they used for storage. And they, they loved this architectural f feature. The building was built in the middle 1950s, and that was the most decorative thing in there. And they wanted that honored. That was kind of sacred. And this is what we ended up with when I got everything I wanted. So here we have uh, new chambers built for the organ, these cases, uh, honor the barrel vault the, uh, or the segmental arch of the window. Uh, it, they look like it was always here and then the organ surrounds the chancel and this console is movable. Uh, this is uh, my smallest instrument. This is for Alexander Chapel at, uh, uh, here at First Presbyterian Church and it's the first time I used uh, and actually so far the only time I've used uh, flamed copper uh, in an organ facade, and that's uh, where blowtorch is used to, to oxidize the copper, and that was to go with the gold leaf ceiling. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful little instrument. In a, the room seats only 50 people. Uh, and the donor said she wanted it designed to accompany uh, Welsh hymnody in, in memory of her husband, and it's based on uh, tonally on English chamber organs of the 18th century, although it's thoroughly modern, but somehow fits into the room and with, uh, with a good deal of dignity. Um, this is the organ in the main church there, uh, and this is, this is a monster organ. Uh, in fact, I have some CDs of this uh, that I brought with me. We have four CDs that are all available on the website. But if you're here today and you want one, there's a special price for attendees here. Uh, and it's, uh, this incorporated a lot of very interesting things, including uh, massive side-by-side -side divisions. Um, one here that's based on, on uh, 17th century North German style organs and this more uh, in the, the English Romantic style. Um, and this little bit, this little star here, this gilded star, when you pull the knob, it rotates and, and little bells tinkle. It's used for special effects in Baroque music. Um, this is the inside of that organ. Again, a flute with double mouths. It's one of those things that I, I like to incorporate into organs. And this is uh, a stop called the flugelhorn, which was developed by Ernest Skinner. Um, 
This looks like another division in that organ, but it's actually one stop, and it's called the grand chorus, and it's on very high pressure, and it's very, very loud, but uh, on the, when you've, you've got 1,500 people singing, plus the choir and the orchestra, you put that on, just don't be any near, where near it when it goes off. Um, this is called a mounted cornet, and each of these sets of pipes here um, is a different overtone, but when they're all played together, they give the sound kind of like a trumpet. So this was the, f the organ was the first synthesizer, and we call these mutational pitches. Um, and you'll notice that uh, one set is, has the canisters with the chimneys, this one is tapered, and the rest are very wide scale open pipes. So they're all tailored to give a specific um, thing. That's the console of which I am quite proud. And this is it from the front. You'll notice um, the jade inserts there and a glass music rack and rosewood petals there. Each different function of toe stud, you hit these and the knobs fly in and out depending on the, uh, the pro these are the, the programmable pistons here. Uh, so you can switch the sounds uh, in the middle of a piece. But we did them by category and different species of wood as you can see there. It's a very elegant console. Um, this next organ is probably the most unusual one I've built. As you probably heard from the last, from the recording, I have an affinity for the uh, romantic organ, the French romantic organ uh, of Augustine Cavaillacol. Um, this is the last work of Henri Matisse. Uh, designed two days before his death as a collage done by one of his assistants. He couldn't really move his hands anymore. And it was made into a stained glass window uh, for the Rockefeller family's uh, church, uh, the Union Church of uh, Mechanical Hills up at the estate at Kaikat. And um, the, uh, the chapel is, has the largest cycle of uh, Chagall stained glass windows in the United States. Um, when uh, Lawrence Rockefeller died, his brother David Rockefeller asked that I build an organ in his memory. And several members of the family and the church community got together. They raised the money for me to build this organ. And um, not only had they run out of spaces for memorial windows, they ran out of Chagall's and Matisse's. Um, but it was really a great deal of fun to, to hear Dr. Rockefeller speak about uh, how he cajoled Matisse into doing the back window and, and everything else. So um, this organ is built very much in the uh, 19th century French style. This is a, actually a copy of, of a console by uh, Augustine Cavaillacol, uh, with the exception of the music rack, which I carved based on uh, a harmonium grill from the, from the same period. Um, and uh, this is the inside of, of the main division. And that is the, uh, the organ on its movable platform surrounded by all of its Chagall windows. So that was, that was a really wonderful thing. Uh, and it, there are recitals there and on certain days of the year they open it up, you can come and look at the stained glass. Uh, and it's, it's always opened up at the right time. Um, and there are also tours up at the estate at Kaikit to see the artwork. The uh, Rockefellers had organs in both their houses, the one on down where the, Metropol uh, the Museum of Modern Art is now, and then one up at the estate house. And uh, the, um, the mansion, the seven-story mansion in, on the west side here was uh, torn down uh, and the museum built to uh, to house Mrs. Rockefeller's collection of newfangled modern paintings. Um, and the one up at Kaikat, when they did start getting larger canvases, the organ took up a lot of space and it's now become gallery space. So this is the new but only remaining Rockefeller family organ. Uh, the organ I get asked the most about is uh, Temple Emanuel here in New York. Um, the, uh, when I told my eldest brother uh, that I had just signed a contract to build the largest synagogue organ in history, 
his response was, well, what are you, what are you gonna do? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> it's like, what are you gonna tell mom? You know, it's like, he didn't think like, well, the answer is we're gonna build it. And um, uh, it was quite an undertaking. It is one of three projects in the temple. We also have an organ in the, uh, in the chapel and in the, uh, in the auditorium, uh, which doubles as a summer sanctuary. And there's a second auditorium, and I wanted to build a fourth organ for the temple, and they, they discouraged that. But uh, most people don't even know they can go into this building. I assure you, you can. If you've not been in there, it seats 2,500 people. It's absolutely vast and beautiful. It's just been restored. Um, that is the, the bima, or the, the, the altar area. And the organ, uh, this is where the choir and the console are. The organ starts here and it goes all the way up there. A lot of the organ is in the north triforium and above the great arch in the ceiling there. It's a massive organ. Uh, this is a blind arch. Those are actually filled in. That's where the elevator shafts for the tower are. It serves to our advantage because when the organ speaks from this way, it bounces out into the room. Give you a sense of scale of how big this is. Uh, that's what the, the Bima looks like with a, an orchestra on it. Um, and that's actually where the, the uh, organ is. It's all in here, here, all the way up in there. You can see sections of it in rooms built on the catwalks above there. This is nine stories up. This is one of the divisions looking inside. You can see the various pipe forms, bassoon here, clarinet, another chimney flute. Um, uh, we also do conservation work. This organ was so vast um, that we kept half of it, of the original 1929 organ. There's a division in the West, the West Gallery Tower called the Echo Division, and people talked about it. They said, well, we know there was a section of the organ back there at one time, but um, you know, we've never heard it play. So we decided to hook it up uh, and to restore it. And um, so this is what we found, and this is it as restored. Um, that's another shot from above. Uh, up in the front, you get interesting, this is a very interesting free read English horn, which matches an engraving in, an, in one of the, the old books there. Um, and half of this was gone, the 1929 stuff was gone. I located a 1919 set and we managed to splice them in. It's a very rare stop, so uh, they, they, they're not made nowadays. And this is the orchestral oboe which actually changes resonator form as it goes up. Um, this is one of the pneumatic relays in there. I call it the spaghetti monster. We could have replaced it with something else, with, with transistors and solid state mechanisms. But I figured, well, if we just put it back the way it was, take it apart, make it pretty, meticulously clean it and refit it, it, it works beautifully. Um, this is a pneumatic orchestral celesta that's in the North Triforium. Um, and uh, the young lady who, who uh, redid these hammers for us, uh, she's never been an organ builder before. Um, and uh, I asked her what, you know, when she, when she started working for us, I said, well, have you ever done any organ building before? And she said, no, but I make my own clothing. I was like, bingo, you're hired. Uh, so this is a wonderful, this is about the size of a station wagon altogether. You'll see the second set of bars and hammers down here. They have resonators um, and selectable dampers. Uh, there is the console. And um, I got these stone inserts to match the uh, fossil stones and jewel stones in the, in the temple. And uh, there's some art deco detailing to match the 1929 building. Um, and this is the, this stop is called the Chazazarot, and it is the ceremonial trumpets uh, that um, are used for services. And the piece we're about to hear now is one that I wrote for these uh, after the organ was completed. Uh, it's a very short piece in memory of my father, and it's called the Fanfare for the Torah Service. And the Torah Service is when 
the, the great arc opens up and the scrolls are taken out. It's a very emotional part of the service. So I, I wrote this for that opening um, and uh, the first thing you'll hear are they look like a family of cobras lined up for a portrait, but they're actually very high pressure ceremonial trumpets and they're hooded out to, to hit that wall and then bounce into the room. So here we go. saying that this, uh, this organ was built a few years ago um, and uh, at, the, uh, at the behest of, of uh, various academic institutions that, that train people in organ building and, and design and so we're still doing this. Um, I wanted to end with something interesting and uh, then you can all uh, if we want questions and responses, if you want to move right to the wine, I know I've taken a lot of time today. This is an automatic player instrument that was in a museum, and uh, it needed conservation. And uh, when it was, you see it has its, uh, its role player there, perforated role player, pneumatic mechanisms, and um, they knew it was an orchestrion built by the, the Velte company. When they took it apart, the stamp was over everything. They now knew where it came from. The sister ship to Titanic. And <laughs> these kind of things show up all the time. It's just great. This was part of not just organ building, but history conservation. And um, when, when Titanic, uh, on April 14th, 1912, hit the iceberg, the Gigantic, which was the third sister ship, was renamed Britannic. When it was stripped down for use as a hospital ship in the Mediterranean, and it eventually got torpedoed. Um, no one knew what happened to the organ. There was an organ that was supposed to go on Titanic. It, it, it never made it on because the ship had to sail. Um, but now it, uh, it, it still has its voice and you can go and hear it sometimes. So I hope this has given you some taste of why, uh, why people do devote their lives to organ building or any other craft. And um, I thank you for your indulgence and time. And if there's any questions, I, I'd love to answer them uh, either now or at the reception. Thank you.